So this talk will be about uh, improving smart art import in LibreOffice itself. Um, I'm Miklos Vajna of Collabora. Uh, and as you will see uh, later, this is a collaboration between Collabora and SUSE. Um, I started my um, LibreOffice activity as a GSOC student, then later worked for SUSE for a while and now at Collabora. Um, regarding smart art, um, the motivation for this work is that we already had basic support for importing smart art, typically from PPTX files, but it can appear in XLSX or DOCX as well. And um, the happy path as a PowerPoint, newer PowerPoint typically writes not only the smart art, which is we will see later a definition of what uh, your content is and what requirements you have on that content, how to lay that content out. But also there is a fallback, uh, which is a pre-rendered during the markup of your smart art, and we can do a reasonably good job of importing that into, into Impress. But when that fallback, drawing a map fallback is not there, then life is much more challenging. So um, we had a number of cases where the output was basically either nothing or some, some letters rendered on top of each other, and that's basically it. So uh, for some cases, we had terrible result. And uh, this work is focusing on improving the rendering result in case there is no drawing gamma fallback. And it's still possible to show something sensible. It's just a, a matter of tracking down what part of the smart app description is not handled at import time and how to fix that. What's the missing implementation piece there? Um, you, would, uh, you, you could say that this is not a real issue. Um, all of the newer PowerPoint uh, versions um, uh, write this drawing gamma fallback, but the problem is that um, there is a large corp corpus of uh, legacy documents uh, which are affected by this no drawing gamma fallback problem. And those, if you edit the document with newer PowerPoint versions, um, as long as you are not editing the smart art, this fallback won't be generated. Also, uh, I like to believe that um, importing these smart arts to impress is just the first time, but uh, it would be much more interesting later to actually edit, uh, allow editing of these smart arts. And if uh, editing is part of the game, then we definitely need to have this functionality to take the drawing gamma, uh, mark, uh, drawing gamma sorry, uh, smart art markup and do our own layout. Um, so that's basically why uh, yeah, I think it's a, it's a good thing that uh, uh, this is improved. Um, and as a next step, I would like to present um, a few smart art types which are now working much better. So the first thing uh, will be uh, the rendering of uh, various list, list types. So uh, for all, the, all of these examples, uh, what you see on the left-hand side is the old LibreOffice rendering result and what you see on the right hand side is the new rendering result in, in Impress. Um, for the vertical box list, the old rendering result was basically not readable. Um, the new one is close to what PowerPoint would do. And then we, we had a um, um, quite similar uh, pre-count um, um, smart art type in PowerPoint called vertical tab list. Um, again, um, the, um, the font color was not correct. Um, also, if you had um, enough content in the, in, the column, in the left column of the pictures or, 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 or the shape, then, then that was not really readable. Um, the new result is, in many cases, not perfect either. So the idea is that um, let's improve this up to the point that at least all the content is readable if there is some interaction between uh, the various shapes of this uh, smart art, then it's clear um, the, what is the, the meaning of that relation. And don't spend um, like a year on just one type, rather make uh, much more types readable and good enough so that we can move on to the next type and so on. 
So this is not perfect, but the hope is that uh, for many types, this is now much more uh, readable and much more usable compared to what it was. So a prime example of this is this line list where the lines are still not perfect, but this was just not readable before. And now we see that this is a line list. Or um, in, the, in the vertical bracket list case, uh, simply the content of, of the actual uh, amount on the right-hand side was completely missing. Or uh, just... Uh, improper sizing of these um, uh, child shapes um, made that it w if you had enough content that it was just not tradable. Um, then we have the vertical table list, uh, which was again something that were, were just the size of these child shapes was so incorrect that if you had enough content that much of the content was simply cut off. So far about uh, um, these various list types. Another a bucket of uh, various subtypes is the process types. Um, and inside that, um, um, the first thing is the, the accent process. So again, just due to the incorrect um, calculation of these um, text shapes, um, in the previous case, uh, the content was basically not readable, and now it's, um, it's readable. Um, I would also note that um, next to the text content, uh, there are also the bullets are no longer missing. And in case you had some more content inside a single text shape and um, um, you had multiple programs with bullets, then the existence of these bullets is very, very important because that's the only visible separator between the separate programs. So just remove the bullets and it's possible that the, the meaning of your content is just uh, not something people can understand. So these bullets are very important. Um, then we have um, one more process type uh, this continuous block process, um, where again, the size of the shape was just so small that if you had enough content, then, then the content was cut off. Um, and um, uh, the last uh, type I was recently working on is this organization chart, which is pretty complex. Um, one metric to, to talk about the complexity of these charts is the number of um, XML lines um, that describe all the constraints for laying out. And the previous ones are typically around uh, 300, 400 lines. The organization chart uh, markup is around 1,200 lines, something like this. So it's pretty complex. It, it just takes a lot of time to simplify these documents up to the point that they are simple enough, that they are still interesting, and it, uh, and it demonstrates the problem. On the other hand, uh, it's, uh, the size is manageable, so actually you can eff efficiently debug that. So um, what you see on this, um, a picture is garbage on the left, as always, but on the right uh, you see a um, strange organization with multiple managers where um, some of the managers have uh, no employees and this manager two has an assistant and also three different employees. And there are connector shapes um, uh, between these two, so you have an idea how um, the organization is actually shaped. Um, and uh, this one was uh, was very interesting because um, uh, this shape is uh, constructed by basically two algorithms. One is the, um, the um, one algorithm is focusing on how you lay out uh, employees um, next to each other, so it's a vertical algorithm, and the other algorithm is uh, focusing on how you uh, lay out. Um, one, one unit as in manager, optionally an assistant, and the employees. So it's a vertical uh, algorithm. And not much of this is documented in the OXMR spec. So your best bet is that you play around with PowerPoint. You get an idea of what's the possible intent. You simplify this huge markup to something sensible, one or two hundred lines. You try to guess um, what's uh, actually in, ignored during import. What's the reason you just get this garbage and not the readable chart? And you try to implement the algorithm in a way that it uh, mostly behaves. 
compared to what you see with black box last time. So, so far are the results. And for the rest, um, I would like to share some uh, uh, details about how this is implemented. Uh, so before any actual coding, um, I spent quite some time on trying to understand just the concepts around smart art. And I think this, this was the most challenging part because um, inside um, the OXML specification, there is a reasonable description of individual XML elements, XML attributes, attribute values, uh, but that's like the, the very small details. But there is no big picture overview in this part. So getting an idea of what, what are the concepts behind this layout um, uh, machinery is, is something that, uh, that was the most challenging for me. So uh, first what we have is um, we have some data for the smart art, which is a hierarchical a tree like uh, data structure um, with data points um, having um, parents and children and siblings. Um, and we have the layout description. And um, the layout description is again a tree of what we call layout nodes. Um, and this is what defines how um, the content will end up on the screen. That means that we have layout nodes for, uh, um, for all the shapes which are visible on the screen. And also we have layout nodes for these containers. So if you have three shapes next to each other and you want to render them on a linear path, then you need a container for, for, um, that has an algorithm associated, associated with it. And it should say that this should be laid out on a linear path. And then you need a layout node for this container as well. So everything is a layout node in this layout description. Then once you have the layout node, which are either shapes or containers or, um, or uh, placeholders for, um, for just spacing between shapes and, and so on. So you have this layout building block called layout nodes. Then you can assign algorithms to these um, layout nodes uh, where the simplest uh, algorithm is the shape, which means that this layout node should be mapped to a drawing of shape and the shape should ha get some data, some content from the, from the data definition. We will uh, see that in a moment. So you have your layout tree, uh, layout nodes, then you associate algorithms uh, to these layout nodes and you organize your layout nodes in a tree. And um, to make this more, much more interesting, the layout tree um, can have um, nodes which are called atoms, um, which allow dynamic behavior. So similar to XSLT, you can have conditions, four cycles, um, choices, and so on. So it's um, almost a whole programming language, which is a bit scary. Um, so you can have um, just, um, let's say, two layout nodes in a, or yep, two layout nodes in a layout tree. One is a, a root node and one children node or child node. And if you have a four layout atom between the two, then according to your data model is dynamic how many actual shape ends up in the document. This is why you need some algorithm deciding how these multiple shapes are laid out. Um, yeah, so we had the building block, the layout node, we had the algorithm, we had the layout tree. So data model mapping is the part that decides how the layout description um, um, is associated with the content you assign to the uh, smart art. This means that typically uh, when you edit your smart art on the user interface, then you only, only uh, edit the data. And all these layout descriptions are hardwired into PowerPoint. And you can create your own custom uh, layout description, but the majority of your users will just use this uh, pre-made 100 types or I did not count them. So there is a long list of uh, pre-existing types and user, users typically work with that. Um, from our point of view, this is a very good news. We have a fixed set of layout descriptions. And of course, we try to solve these um, layout differences um, 
gener uh, in a generic way, but actually what users care about is really just, just this fixed set of layout um, descriptions, and if these are working, then users are typically happy. This is a bit easier problem compared to just handling random input for this layout algorithm and expecting that it's behaving exactly the same as PowerPoint all the time. Um, so the data mobile the mapping uh, decides how to uh, associate um, the layout nodes to, to zero, one, or multiple data nodes. Um, finally, um, the last thing that um, really affects the shapes is that for layout nodes with um, with the shape algorithm, you can associate shape properties. And again, this is tightly coupled to drawing a map, so all the properties are using the drawing a map markup. Um, and later we will see this is why we don't do a direct import of smart art into Impress, rather first we take the drawing a map um, input, we uh, generate drawing ML, um, um in memory rep representation for that, and we use the existing drawing ML import to actually map that to our shape model, because this way we can share a lot of code. Uh, what else? We have constraints, so this is the, the most complex part of that. You, can, you could even use an SAT solver to find out what, what's the optimal um, value for the various requirements to lay out these shapes properly. The good news is that so far this was not necessary. The current implementation is um, a one pass uh, layout. So we never position uh, shapes multiple times and so far this is, uh, even, even this much simpler uh, approach is um, giving a reasonable result. So constraints are the ones which um, decide um, all the properties of all the layout nodes, like what should be the spacing between the shapes, what should be the, uh, their size, their position, um, their, the font size of the content inside the shapes, and so on, and so on, and so on. Um, if you use um, this um, automatic um, text sizing in Impress for normal shapes, then this is similar, it's just not, not a single setting which does something automatically, but a long list of properties and all of these are calculated automatically. Um, next to constraints, there are rules. Rules are used for uh, dealing with situations when you have conflicting requirements. So in case, um, for example, you give constraints that um, it's clear what should be the size of the shape, but then you have lots of content inside the shape. You have this conflicting requirement that on one hand you want to have all your content visible, on the other hand you have requirements for the size of the shape, so it should be, let's say, small. And then rules come into the picture, and rules can decide what happens when you have the conflicting requirement. For example, uh, the rule might say that um, if there is not enough space inside the shape, then you should give up the constraint about the height of the shape, so it will be a very tall one, but at least your content is readable. Or you can decide that the conflict resolution should be, that the font size should be decreased, so that it will be very hard to read, but at least all the content will be there. And the very last concept is the text properties. So um, next to the shape properties, you can define all, um, all, the, all the aspects of uh, text as content appearing inside these shape nodes. Basically, these are the high-level concepts. And once you have a rough understanding of what these mean, then it makes sense to jump to the reference and actually read about what the individual XML elements, attributes, attribute values um, are doing. So regarding the actual markup, this is all part of OXML um, with the same benefits and problems of the general OXML documentation. Sometimes something is reasonably documented, sometimes the documentation is completely opaque on, on the details. Um, inside the, the PPTX file, um, we typically have either four or five XML streams, like XML files inside this uh, zip package. Um, we have the data for the, the, for the um, shape, then we have, this is, this is the only piece which is actually edited by the users uh, uh, using the PowerPoint user interface, typically. Um, then we have um, 
we can have uh, shape styles which are um, specific to this smart art instance. Uh, this is uh, defined in the quick style XML. This is typically not edited by the user. We can have uh, scholar schemes. Um, this is using almost the same markup as document themes. So um, this is again something that's typically not edited by the users. They just say that uh, they want some, some dark color, let's say dark. And, and in practice, perhaps that will be dark blue. And then they some, uh, want some text on that. So it should be text color and it will be white so that it's actually readable on dark blue. Um, then there is the, um, the layout XML. So this is the, uh, this is the um, uh, container for the constraints. This, this is the one that um, you read the most um, when you try to improve this code. And again, this is a fixed sound. So uh, you choose that you want a vertical bracket list, and then you get a, a fixed layout. And whatever you do with your content, the layout definition is not changing. And optionally, there is this drawing um, uh, stream, which is a pre-calculated drawing among group shape. And if it's there, then we can easily just import that into, uh, into Impress. Um, yeah, so, so much about the markup. So um, speaking, up, um, speaking about how this is um, in the LibreOffice code base, um, all this smart art handling is uh, inside the drawing ML import, and there is a subdirectory for diagrams, which is just uh, the name for smart art. Probably smart art is some product name, and diagram is the alias used in the specification, but they are the same. Um, at the moment, all of this uh, lay, uh, layout is happening at PPTX import time or OXML import time. Um, so if you want to test how this behaves, then you need to open a file, and you will see the result, and you tweak the code, and again, you re-import. Um, so it's unlike writer layout where you open a document and you actually edit the document and see how the layout um, reacts to your keystrokes. This is an import time thing. And as mentioned, um, this is a two-step um, approach. So first, uh, we parse the, the smart art markup, and we um, uh, produce a tree of these uh, drawing gamma shape objects, and then later, we, we give this um, shape tree, uh, drawing ML shape tree to the drawing ML importer, and that, that one will issue the, or, or invoke the necessary UNO calls so that the actual shape objects are created. Um, so that's the, that's the high level overview of the actual implementation. Um, then regarding how, how this is tested, um, the easiest way is integration task. So you load the document into Impress, and then um, you can use the UNO API to find out uh, the various properties of the, um, the shapes. Given that this is import time, all the layout thing is actually part of the document model once the layout finished. So you can just use the, the UNO API, which would be available as macros for macros as well, um, to assert the size, position, uh, or content of the various shapes. Uh, given that um, all the layouting is done uh, with these containers around the, the shape nodes, uh, there can be uh, quite a deep uh, hierarchy of group shapes. So the top container is always a group shape, but um, till you actually find the shape that has the text, it, it can happen that you have five or four um, group shapes inside each other till you actually re uh, reach your content. Um, but the benefit of this is that there is um, um, more or less one-to-one -one mapping between the, the original layout tree and the resulting document model, and then um, you can reason about if this is a correct mapping or not. So um, this is somewhat helpful for debugging, and the users typically care about the, the resulting layout, so they probably want ungroup uh, all the group shapes in, in four or five stages. Um, I have no numbers what was the, the state when I started working on this, but uh, today we have almost 30 tasks, uh, like uh, 30 loaded documents with different uh, smart art setups and loads of asserts. 
Um, so when I start working on a new type, then add one test document uh, for that type. Hopefully that's uh, complex enough. And then as, as I incrementally try to improve the, the layout so that it produces something sane, then I keep adding new tests inside that, uh, that single test function. So there are loads of SRs compared to just the number of loaded documents. Hopefully that's a good trade-off between very long-running make check versus uncovered code. Um, and the good news is that, um, again, this is future work, uh, for, at least technically, so um, you can do all your changes with the matching test coverage. So um, at least what was presented here as a result, all the improvements were in the form of coins doing behavior change and test change, no change be, be, without a matching test case. So um, that's basically it, uh, thanks to our partner Susa, who um, sponsored uh, part of this work, so this is why it was possible that I worked on this. And that mostly concludes my presentation. Thanks. Are there any questions? Uh, yes, in the front row, Regina. Yes, at, at the moment um, we, we read this and if you write back to PPTX then we actually remember the markup so it's not lost, but editing at the moment is not possible. Um, although, as you saw from the architecture, um, um, the mapping from the, or, the smart art to actual shapes is, is a separate block. So in the future, if we have lots of time and motivation, it would be possible to move this from the PPTX import to actually impress core. And then in the long run, this would also allow editing. But there are loads of problems to be solved first. But uh, it's, we are heading in that direction, yes. Uh, and another question in the back. The, the current state of the export is that if you just import your smart art and you save back to PPTX, then the, all this um, smart app markup is remembered. But uh, you can't edit your shape and still preserve your, your smart art uh, declarative uh, uh, description at the same time. I don't have numbers on that, and it's also an interesting question how you measure that. Uh, what I know is that I'm still aware of uh, some problems which are interesting for SUSE, and we focus on our customers because that's how we get our paycheck. So um, I still plan to continue working on this, and um, let's see what will be the next step. Okay, thanks for listening again.